Hello, I'm Chris Hartwell, and welcome to The Heartbeat, the place where I talk about just a few of the things that make this little guy tick. Today, I'm going to be talking about episode four of season two of HBO's The Leftovers. Join me, won't you? So, as I've done each time, I'm going to talk about a few of the positives from this week's episode, then a few of the negatives, and then kind of wrap up with what I'm looking forward to next week on The Leftovers. You may have also noticed, if you've watched any of my other reviews from The Leftovers, that I really do enjoy comparing and contrasting this season to last season. But not only that, I really enjoy comparing this piece of Damon Lindelof writing to other pieces of his work, whether it be his films or television shows. And why I really enjoy doing that is I feel like not only does it illustrate and highlight what Damon Lindelof likes to do as a storyteller, how he likes narratives to unfold, how he likes to present characters, all of which is very fascinating. It also gives me a much deeper appreciation of the show in the moment as it slowly develops its plot, slowly develops its character, and so instead of just sitting there angry that they're not giving me the answers to the big questions, I can actually enjoy the smaller revelations, the more subtle character moments, and kind of those multi-layered, multi-tiered, beautiful images that they're constantly putting in front of me. And this week certainly had lots of those moments and lots of those images that were just as strong as in the previous three episodes as well as in last season. The earthquake at the beginning of the episode definitely definitely been an example of that. You could feel this place of miracle just shaking, waiting to burst. Things are so taut here and about to erupt. Or Kevin's dog running down the street without him. Mm. Kevin is off the leash. Stuff is about to go crazy with him too. And how about the really haunting, desperate vibe that's put out when the crowd rushes forward to scoop up the remaining water from the now empty spring, which is intercut with Nora walking in slow motion through the forest, and then finally comes to rest in all the dead fish and desolation of that place. All underscored by the fantastically ethereal Schubert music. Continuing to compare and contrast this season to last season, I think it's really interesting and really impressive by the fact that Damon Lindelof and Tom Prada have continued to develop these characters in very natural, realistic, and interesting ways. Too often I feel like I get to the end of a first season of any television show and feel like, well, maybe they haven't explored these characters completely, but they've explored the most interesting parts of them, the most compelling parts of them, and that has not been the case on this second season of The Leftovers. Also contrasting this episode to Lindelof's other television show, Lost, it's great to see him actually avoid in the character department anyways, a lot of the pitfalls that are associated with writing a TV drama. So for example, on Lost we have characters like Ana Lucia, a character whose purpose becomes readily apparent, that being to complicate things, to throw a wrench in the equation, to present a new set of obstacles for our heroes to navigate around, but the problem is all those things end up being done so forcibly that it ultimately comes off as unreasonable, melodramatic, or just downright annoying. It is true Ana Lucia, I am sorry. To be fair though, I guess it's not just the new characters that can fall prey to this. Um, sometimes our pre-existing characters can suddenly adopt rather unmotivated desires and sometimes have very ridiculous ways of expressing them. Like Jack and Sora beating one another to a bloody pulp at the end of season 5. Which is why it's so great and refreshing that things continue to be handled so well in The Leftovers. With Nora, for example, when she wakes up and thinks that Kevin's disappeared, you're taken right into her point of view and helped to understand where she would be and why she would pass out. A moment that was phenomenally captured and beautifully shot with that crazy camera angle that flipped right upside down and in no way felt showy to me or over the top because that is exactly how a Nora would feel in that nightmare of a situation. It's happened again. The people that she's starting to love, that she's starting to invest in, and that control she was starting to have suddenly feels ripped from her. All that comes from that crushing fear and that need to maintain control, which is beautifully presented in that first scene. It also shows us, too, what it continues to grow from the seeds that were planted in the scene between Nora and the MIT scientists. No matter how loudly Nora may declare, the ark is full, a sudden departure will never happen again, and scenes like the one between her and Jill, which was beautifully acted and beautifully written, by the way. Her actions, which were quite literally chaining Kevin to her arm, declared much louder, I need to maintain control, and yet I feel like I don't have it. Also, another element that the writers and Carrie Coon, the actress who plays Nora, presented so well in this episode was just that feeling of kind of mentally backpedaling with where she's at with Kevin. Just those thoughts of, did I make the right decision sticking with this man? Did I make the right decision coming out to Miracle Texas? And Carrie Coon had a great comment in an interview recently where she said, in some ways she had a moment to be entirely free. She was about to leave town and then this baby sucked her back into this life and she made the choice to reinvest in being a wife and a mother again. But that seed of leaving and being someone else is still in her. And that's the fundamental tension in Nora this year. 
And that specific tension is actually summed up really well in the kind of comedic line that Kevin has to Nora after she's handcuffed herself to him, which is, I hope you found the key too. And though it said glibly, it also plays on that extra level of these two people trying to decide if they should remain together. And speaking of those two, the relationship continues to be one of the highlights for me this season. And though it can sometimes be brutal and depressing, I think it's both of those things because it is so honest and it's being presented so truthfully. And I feel like Carrie Coon actually summed up the relationship really well again when she said, this relationship, which was forged in a crucible, is just moving to another crucible, where it will either be galvanized or burned to a crisp. And though I couldn't tell you where that relationship will end up this season, I think it's quite clear that Kevin really wants it to work out when he earnestly declares things like, I love you, or are we okay to Nora? And whereas Nora is really trying to find safety in maintaining control, I think Kevin is trying to find safety in rebuilding a family. And that's kind of his objective this season. And that's why this episode, he was pushing so hard against Patty, really trying to ignore her because what she was trying to tell him and trying to get him to admit, which is quite clearly stated in her dialogue, is that he doesn't love that family and he doesn't want that family because he's trying to kill himself and he's fighting with all his might to deny that. Because to admit that will bring him right back to the place that he was in the first season, losing Laurie, losing Tom, and almost losing Jill. And speaking of that love of family, it was really John's fierce pursuit of his family, which is very akin to Kevin's, as well as, in contrast to Kevin, his more threatening, volatile strength that continues to make him such an interesting, well-acted character. Props to Kevin Carroll for that. And yet, so unlike a character like Ana Lucia from Lost, John is able to be contradictory, he's able to present himself as a roadblock to her other characters, and yet do so in a very relatable, understandable, reasonable way. Making something as extreme as getting shot in the stomach and not feeling it actually believable. And though she wasn't given as much to do in the episode as her husband, Regina King, who plays John's wife, did a phenomenal job in that scene between her and Kevin where she talks about Evie and who she is and presents kind of her ideas on what happened to her. And all that leads me to say, what continues to baffle me is how well Damon Lindelof and Tom Parada present these differing ideas from differing people and allow me to genuinely question which is true because obviously only one is objectively true. Either Evie Murphy was abducted and murdered or she ran away or she departed. Only one of those things can be true, but at this point, in time, I genuinely see the validity of each person's point of view and each person's perspective. And, oh, I love the scene between Matt and Nora where we finally understand his motivation for wanting to be a miracle, that being he's wanting to get his wife back. And can I just say that I think it's very commendable that Jenna Malo, a phenomenal actress from shows like The West Wing, chooses to appear week after week in a kind of a catatonic state where she just stares blankly off into space. And my complimenting to the characters would not be complete if I didn't mention Jill and Michael, both of whom are fast becoming some of my favorite characters on the show. I just love how different they are to the rest of the characters, how, in a way, undramatic they are. And I'm not concerned, there's plenty of time for them to devolve and completely fall apart like everyone else, but right now there is a simplicity to them and the simplicity to the relationship. And with Michael especially, actually a couple of his moments were some of my favorite from the episode, those being when he asked Jill if she was alone and she said yes and he said me too and kind of just broke down. That was really moving and, and actually kind of surprised me. I wasn't expecting that scene to go that specific direction. And just those final beautiful long tracking shots that ultimately lead to him scraping off the orange tag off the front of his house. I did want to use that fun relationship though to kind of segue into talking about a few of the things that didn't work as well for me in this episode because as much as I enjoyed the performances from both Michael and Jill and all the scenes that they shared together, there was an element in all those moments in the direction and the writing especially that felt a little bit conventional, a little bit paint by the numbers to me. Comparing and contrasting that relationship to Kevin and Nora's from the first season, which though I also saw coming, but that predictability of that relationship in the first season didn't bother me because each of the times they interacted, there was something always so unique about those interactions. Like the moment where they bumped into one another walking out of the courthouse having both just gotten divorces. In this instance though, there was just kind of that well, of course, Jill would be covered in water the first time that she and Michael interacted, or of course, Michael would accidentally leave the wrench on the countertop so that Jill would stop by later with it. And that kind of of course factor, so to speak, is one that plagued me throughout the episode. Because the whole first season of The Leftovers is based upon Tom Prada's book, and you can feel Damon Lindelof and Tom Prada kind of sprinting as fast as they can to include all these really eloquently conceived, beautifully executed twists and turns that Prada had put in that book, as well as a smattering of new ideas that they conceived of for the television show. And so not only did that provide a foundation for those unique moments to happen, it also provided a felt end goal, where each episode did feel self-contained, each of those 50 minutes did feel satisfying in and of themselves, but at the same time, there was this knowledge that they really were moving towards a specific destination. And very much in contrast to the characters and the success of those characters in this specific episode and the way that they were not being written kind of in your cliche, annoying TV drama way, I felt like some of the plot and the pacing and the conflicts in this episode did feel a little bit TV drama. And let me explain what I mean by that. 
things feel a little less exciting and a little less worth engaging in, and therefore a little more TV drama, as I call it, when the conflicts that continue to arise throughout an episode are discovered not to be conflicts so much as misunderstandings. So for example, the two times that Kevin interacts with the cops, or when John shows up at night and forces Kevin to come with him. And though some would argue that a missing cell phone or an unfortunately placed handprint are far more immediate and tangible dilemmas, I personally find them much less unique, bold, and unsettling as not knowing what the guilty remnant is up to. And though I absolutely believe that there's a balance that needs to be struck between those more immediate, quickly resolved dilemmas and the more mysterious long-term conflicts, if they instead start churning out misunderstandings, it starts to feel like they're treading water, like they're sacrificing naturalism, realism, and freshness for the sake of just drawing things out. And for me, nothing was more telling than this than Erica Murphy's line at the end of the episode, which was, things are going to change now. And it just made me feel like the entire episode was nothing more than a wind-up for what was going to come next week. I felt like this week also had a few more unfortunate moments where Damon Lindelof was just feeling a little insecure about the audience picking up what he was putting down. Like he felt like he needed to tell them what was going on in the character's mind. And it was the publisher scene last week, and this week it was the scene where Patty's following Kevin around, telling him what is going on in his mind. And made an awesome character like Patty kind of just seem pointless. Though, to swing back to the positive, I really did enjoy the scene between the pair of them when they were in the dried up reservoir and Patty's kind of pointing Kevin towards his missing cell phone. It really did get me to continue to ask, is she actually there or is Kevin just going crazy? Speaking of more things that I'm looking forward to uh, continuing to dive into, I am really looking forward to seeing where Matt goes next week. I feel like we haven't seen that character really fight for something in the way that he fought for his church in episode three of the first season. And I feel like next week, we're really gonna see him have to take the gloves off and really fight to stay in this place. And though I don't think we'll find out about it for a while, I am really excited to see what happens with Kevin and his palm print on the car. And I still really want to know who is John Murphy actually? What is his backstory? What is he all about? Why do people fear him? And how long will it take for him to get to Virgil, the old man at the gas station who seems to have some sort of prophetic power? And it's just a little thing, but what is inside of that present that Evie gave to John? So to wrap things up on this review of Orange Tag, I'm sure it's clear that I was a little bit let down by this week's episode of The Leftovers. But with that said, it is kind of impressive to me that even at its weakest, The Leftovers is still head and shoulders above so many television shows that are out there. I'm still invested in the characters, I'm still excited by the mysteries, and I still cannot wait for next week. Those are my thoughts anyways. I would still love to know what you guys think, so please comment below. Let me know. Did this week's episode feel different to the rest of The Leftovers? Did it feel more TV drama to you? Um, are you still investing in the characters? Are they still exciting to you? Please comment below and let me know. Also, please do subscribe. I will continue to review films and television on this channel, and I would love for you to stay up to date on all those things. But for now, I'm Chris Hartwell. This is The Heartbeat. Thank you for joining me.